Okay, good evening everyone. Um, uh, I want to start by thanking our speakers for coming. I mean, for me it's an honor for them to, out of their busy schedule, to find time to come and speak to us on a very important topic that we are going to discuss today. Um, I think it's something that we would really learn a lot from in the next few uh, uh, minutes. Um, so the African Institute has a graduate student committee, and so the graduate student committee actually, you know, we're like, I don't know how to put it, like a subgroup, why let me use the word subgroup, but we want to be able to look at so many issues and try and see how we can get graduate students together, give them some insights into things that we're doing, and one of the things we're doing is actually the speaker series, and this is the first of its kind. And basically the speaker series is it's just a gathering like this where we can meet and discuss and get ideas, especially for those who haven't been to Africa or who want to go to Africa or who want to learn about Africa. I think this is an opportunity that we have. Um, we're starting off this series with looking at two countries, Ghana and Madagascar. And um, we're looking at the resources in-house to be you know, people who have worked there, who have traveled there, who have technically lived in those countries, so they can actually give us, you know, insights that a lot of us probably don't have. Uh, even if we are from Africa, you know, Africa is huge and there are so many countries within Africa and uh, believe you me, a lot of countries are completely different from each other. And so even for us to sit down and learn and to listen, it's actually going to be very revealing for us. And so this is the first of its kind. We're hoping that subsequent speaker series, we could have the reverse. We could have Africans come and tell us something unique. Maybe we look for a topic that will resonate with what everyone wants to hear and then get experts, as we've gotten experts today, on these two countries. Um, and so, the title of today's um, program is actually behind the scenes, sharing experiences of doing research in Ghana and Madagascar. Uh, Ghana is in West Africa and Madagascar is in the southern part of Africa. And so these two countries are completely different. And so we're going to learn a lot from the interactions we'll have today. Uh, I would want to introduce our speakers so that um, we have a background of, uh, of them. I'll start from my right. Let me, let me tell you a quick joke. <laughs> I noticed, so we have some, you know, something at home, and I noticed something that once it's a left-handed person, and we're doing this, like, much, much past training, and so when we tell people left-handed, who are left-handed, we always notice that they started marching from the left. So sometimes for me, I always get confused, <laughs> and I want to be sure, I'll just stand in this direction, and say, it's my right, it's my left, and other than that, so please, pardon me if I miss my left or right. I, I always give directions and I'll say like turn left and I'll point to the right. <laughs> I, I do it all the time. The thing you got to understand is like the way I point is the way I actually mean. <laughs> well, oh, no. sometimes it, it can be a bit confusing. Yeah. So, uh, but I'll start with um, Patrick. That's for my left. So Patrick is a, is an adjunct professor at the Ivy Business School. He specializes in international development and poverty alleviation especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Underpinning his research area uh, includes on, so his, his research rights on entrepreneurship and on the role of development organizations in market-based poverty alleviation. As part of these interests, Patrick is a research coordinator for Western University's African Institute, as well as an associate director of the Social Innovation Research Lab. Patrick has extensive experience doing field research in Africa, having led research projects in Ghana, Tanzania, Kenya, and Rwanda. He also has experience working in the education sector in post-earthquake Haiti, and in Ghana and Tanzania, in, in Ghana and Tanzania. Patrick is currently leading field ex experiments in partnership with two major international development organizations. 
Patrick has, has also been actively engaged in disseminating the case-based ped pedigree to African universities. Specifically, Pastor has also taught, taught uh, case teaching and case writing workshops at a number of universities in Ghana and Kenya. He has also supported African faculty in writing teaching cases. Uh, I should also add that he's in June, he's moving to Finland to start off a new position there in the sustainability of business. <laughs> Yes. And I think we're very honored to have Patrick here to speak to us about his experience in Ghana. Uh, to his right is Syria. <laughs> and so Syria is a PhD candidate in the geography department and has been working in West Africa since 2011, both in research as well as in program and policy development, including as a consultant. Her research is currently taking is currently taking a critical and participatory approach in examining gender inequity in small-scale farming and household food security in northern Ghana. She examines changes in culture and how it's influenced by uh, changes in ecology, like rainfall and soil, and political economy, like land tenure. She has a, a bachelor's from the University of Toronto in political science and African studies an MA from the Institute of Development Studies at the University of um, Sussex in the UK in gender and development. Her development work experience has been in agriculture extension and food security policy and planning across Africa, but mostly in Ghana and Syria alone. She has worked with Oxfam Canada, the Foundations for International Teaching, World Vision, Engineers Without Border, and AgriTerm Canada, Future Agriculture Consortium, and the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in different countries, working through mostly Canadian and British uh, government funded projects. To Sarah's left sorry, is Miyuan Zan. She's also a fourth year PhD student from the Department of Anthropology in Western University. Uh, her PhD explores how the meaning of being Chinese is culturally and socially constructed in the north part of Madagascar by focusing on the social influences of encounters between Mandarin speaking Chinese and the Malagasy people in three particular contexts. The first being the encounters at Sugar plantation managed by Chinese-owned corporations. The second, the global connections of Chinese and Malag Malagasy private businessmen made possible by cheap made in China commodities in Diego Su Sures, Madagascar, and Guaz Guazo in China. And the third is the classrooms of Confucius Institute, a worldwide educational project sponsored by the Chinese government aiming to promote Chinese language and culture in Diogo Sures, Madagascar. She finished her master's in the Department of Anthropology here in Western and researching about how tourism influences the old other Minionite communities in St. Saint, Saint Jacob's, Ontario. Before coming to Western, she had an undergrad in Renin University of China and majored in international politics. And lastly is um, Dr. Andrew Wersch. Uh, and his past research focused on the parallel rise and divergent fates of northern Madagascar's Safia and ecotourism trades. More specifically, he has studied how the lives of the Malagasy people involved in these trades are shaped not only by the particular sorts of work required of them, but by the peculiar demands of the foreign consumers served by their work. This work resulted in the publication of Made in Malagasy, Sapphires, Ecotourism, and the Global Bazaar. More recently, he has focused on small-scale transitional, transnational humanitarian development and conservation projects in northern Madagascar. He, currently is, he is currently involved in a collaborative research and teaching projects involving faculty and students at Western University 
and the investor of Aunt Shiranana, Northern Madagascar. And for more information, you can actually check the, uh, the anthropology department's um, web page. So I want to thank our, our speakers. I think it's an honor for them to come and share their experiences. And I really look forward to getting their perspectives on a number of topics. Um, so the way we're going to approach it, I'm going, I have about five main questions and I would call, I would, you know, start with one and just ask broad questions around that one. And uh, I'll leave it for them to give us their own perspectives on each of those questions. And when I think we've done some good discussions on that, I move to the next. And then finally, we can then open it up for questions and answers and if you need clarity. So I advise you, you can take your notes while they speak so that there um, will be a test. <laughs> <laughs> and it will be graded. <laughs> okay, so I'll start with the first question. And my very first question is your personal story. Um, sometimes you always want to have, there's always a story behind why we make certain decisions in life. And so for me, my first question is, what is your personal story? Why did you choose Africa in your research uh, path? When and how did you get the opportunity to work in Africa? Because not all of us will have the opportunity to work in Africa. Where did you get funding? Assuming you were to teach a class on how to get funding or sort for funding, how did you go about it? What is your motivation for choosing to work in, your, in the particular chosen African country? And in this case, it's Ghana and Madagascar. <laughs> And what were your most memorable experiences? So this is all encapsulated in your personal story. So maybe I could start with Charlie. With me? Okay, yeah. sure. Well, thank you for uh, for asking. And it's uh, so it's now I'm the I'm the clearly the oldest person here. <laughs> So I don't. So I can tell you, it's it's been 25 years now since I first went to Madagascar. When is about the age of probably some of you here? I was 22 when I first went, and I went as a master's student. And I didn't intend to, I didn't intend to do research in Madagascar. I was doing a master's degree in Toronto at the University of Toronto, and had a a, a professor there who uh, who who had done research in the Comoro Islands, which is in the Mozambique Channel, and uh, was planning uh, uh, a, uh, uh, to do research in Madagascar, and uh, had money, had funding, shirk, good old shirk funding, to do research, and he asked me if it was something I was interested in. At the time, I admit, I really knew nothing about Madagascar. It was, it was, um, uh, it was, and I, I had never traveled, I had never really done anything. So I'd like to say it was a lifelong passion to go to Madagascar, but it, it really was a complete um, accident for me. But, uh, <laughs> but a fantastic one, as it turns out. And it's so, for, I, I, we, we, well, I traveled in last summer, and it's, it was my 15th trip over the last 25 years. Um, and what we do in anthropology is um, there is a tendency to, uh, in the kind of research that I do anyways, to sort of develop um, social networks, connections. The first time I went, I lived for about six months, and then the second time as a PhD student, I went for more than a year. And uh, in the years since, it's always been, you know, a couple of months or more recently, uh, just weeks at a time, uh, but always to the same place, always to the same, not, not all over Madagascar, but it's one particular region in Madagascar, and um, I guess the, uh, the, the 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 so as I said, funding was from Shirk, and my most memorable experiences from early on really were um, experiences uh, as 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 a, a young person of encountering on the one hand what what I guess I envisioned I would do in anthropology, which is encountering a world and a way of living uh, and people who were very different from me, but also clearly encountering people with whom I had a great deal in common and, and with whom I felt pretty quickly a kind of a uh, uh, connections and people who, uh, and that's largely thanks to these people who took me in um, 
in this community where I was living, and uh, I think a very familiar st uh, story of researchers uh, who go to work in Madagascar or elsewhere in Africa and the world, I think, is working in small rural communities where you very quickly sort of become part of the community and become incorporated into them. And if what a nice thing about that is that it's kind of extended now, so that the people who are my are my sisters and brothers in Madagascar are now Mingwen's <laughs> aunts and uncles <laughs> in a strange way. Does that show maybe I'll turn it over to her <laughs> next? Yeah. I don't know. Um, okay, my name is Ming Wan, uh, and I work with Andrew, I'm his PhD student. So how I started working in Madagascar was really kind of a replicate of how you started. Um, before I went, I had, I really, I wouldn't expect to be working in Madagascar at all, um, because I had no knowledge of Malagasy language and no knowledge of French, um, which is kind of key in anthropology uh, research. It's like the basis. You have to speak the language in order to communicate and do interviews with the people there. Um, but then when I applied for the PhD program here at Western and Andrew, based on his 25 years of experience working um, in Madagascar, so he actually made a suggestion uh, for me to go and to just explore the opportunities of working there because um, I'm a Chinese um, and he knows that there is a sugar plantation, actually the biggest sugar plantation in Madagascar, managed by a state-owned corporation in China. And as China is coming to Africa, it's becoming the huge topic recently, uh, you know, uh, on social, um, on media and politics and journalism. So uh, then that's how I said, you know, I need to take this opportunity and to go and to see whether I like it or not. And actually I do. And then uh, Andrew also um, funded me generously with a good old shirk. <laughs> and then um, uh, what else? Uh, so I did the trip two times. So I, I, I spent 14 months in total in Madagascar. The first time I spent three months, um, the second time for uh, the first time was like a preliminary um, research trip, um, but I went with the, the, the a collaboration uh, field course program that Andrew led uh, between the uh, Western undergrad students and uh, the students from a local university, Madagascar, called University Tansirana. And then um, the second time I went and I stayed for 11 months, so almost a year, and uh, that was the key part period that I did my PhD field work and my most memorable um, thing about it is I mean the whole experience of spending 14 months there is just like the really memorable for me because um, it was the first it was my first trip to Africa even though it's not on the African continent and then I have never um, realized how wrong media is <laughs> that represents Africa all the time. Um, because before that, all you get from media and from many things is a very generalized idea about Africa and, um, and how bad it is, unfortunately. Um, but once I go, and then I realize, oh, this is very, very wrong. And, uh, and now, you can, now you have some, a lot of new insights about um, what Africa really looks like what the Chinese are doing in Africa. <laughs> yeah. So, great. I guess, yeah, just to build on, on this point about this point that, you know, the story, the single narrative of what we say about Africa and then how diverse and, and it, you know, multivaried and complicated the continent actually is, is also what interested me uh, and in, in brought me to the working on the continent. So uh, like any good undergrad student, I became curious about sort of understanding deeper root, the root cause of certain problems and interested in solving them. Uh, and I became interested in the continent of Africa because it was talked about in a way that was always talking about problems and aid as the solution, development as the solution. So I decided after being tired of doing my undergrad and reading and writing, I want to actually go uh, do something. So after working in an NGO in Canada, writing all these proposals for funding about this wonderful place, I decided, let me go 
uh, actually spend some time there. Uh, and so my work didn't start in academia or uh, with any funding for research. I actually uh, got a position with Engineers Without Borders Canada and why I admired working with them was because they actually invested in staff to spend time in communities trying to understand uh, different types of people's perspectives. They encourage you to learn the language and live amongst communities uh, and really give you your opportunity to sort of take your work in the direction that you think it wants to go. So it's very uh, exploratory. Uh, so I spent a year and a half in northern Ghana and they fortunately placed me uh, with the local Ministry of Food and Agriculture district offices. So I had the opportunity to uh, work in the Ministry of Agriculture uh, with staff who spend a lot of time with farmers in their communities. Uh, my research is focused on agriculture and food, but I actually didn't know anything about this before going into it. Engineers uh, Without Borders needed a social scientist. They needed someone to think about why their technical solutions weren't being adopted or weren't being successful. So I had the opportunity to <coughs> work with government service providers and I went across 20 different districts and uh, that's where I sort of developed the deep appreciation for the complexity of the problems and the, the way it relates to history and culture and politics and everything. Uh, <laughs> so that sort of work brought me to pursue further graduate study and consultancy work on a number of agriculture policy and programs. Uh, both in Ghana and, and across West Africa, I've spent some time in Sierra Leone. Um, so I decided to pursue research. So originally the funding uh, was with Engineers Without Borders and Canadian and British funded projects, consultancies. When I decided to come do the PhD, um, I found an amazing supervisor from Northern Ghana and an agriculture expert, uh, you know, two people I wouldn't have found anywhere else uh, and they helped me develop a shirk proposal uh, and win some funding to sort of pay a salary to do this research and have the opportunity to teach uh, and I decided I wanted to go back to those sites uh, to do the research and I went twice uh, back to those same communities that I've worked in and lived in um, and the first bit of funding for that came from the QES, the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship with the Africa Institute. So that got me by for a few months, uh, I think about four months. And then I did most of my qualitative research off of that, or some of it, and uh, sort of ran out of funding. <laughs> 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 I had to come back, uh, also for other reasons. But then I was able to win an IDRC grant uh, to pursue some longer uh, research and different, uh, different things. So. I obviously I have Western Geography to thank, Africa Institute to thank, um, my supervisors, Shirk especially. So funding seems to come from multiple uh, angles and I don't really know how to make sense of it all. Uh, all I know is that that's what I've been given and yeah, and I'm, well, I hope that I can continue for the next 25 years <laughs> going back to Northern Ghana uh, and continue the work in agriculture and food security, certainly. That would be the dream. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> when, when Andrew was speaking at the beginning and, and mentioning that, uh, you know, you wish you had some sort of grand story of, of how this all came together and it had been a lifelong dream to work in Madagascar, but that's not the case. I, I resonated with that because, like, <laughs> Uh, so this will make sense as I tell my story. So um, originally when I applied for and was accepted into the PhD program at Ivy, uh, I was originally more interested in uh, environmental sustainability, so like environmental stuff within large corporations in North America. Um, but then I had an intervening, okay, so those applications are due at the beginning of January. Uh, but for a whole confluence of events, I ended up spending some time in Haiti in January and February of that year. That was back in 2011 uh, because I'm originally an engineer and a contact of mine, a friend of a friend really, um, was involved with a charity who ran a school system there. Um, and so I, they asked me to do some engineering work on said school system, so I did. 
Um, and that's kind of, that was my first experience in the developing world, uh, where, you know, one's eyes get open to, hey, things are different in other parts of the world. Uh, I got outside my Canada bubble. Previously, like, my only experience outside of my Canada bubble was America um, and New Zealand, which are, you know, not, not so far outside of the Canada bubble. So, with that being said, then I, I ended up at Ivy, uh, was accepted, yay. Um, and the su my supervisor who I was placed with for my first two years while doing coursework, uh, Juana Brenze, she uh, had a project going on in Rwanda at the time, and so I got involved with that uh, and spent the first, spent three months during my first uh, summer of my PhD program there, um, working on a few things. Um, and uh, I mean, most of that work didn't, didn't come to fruition, um, but that's, that's kind of, so while I spent some time there, I ended up being, you know, somehow I ended up in charge of training people how to be entrepreneurs and like, I was not the right person to do this because like, I know stuff about business, but I don't know how business works in, in, in Rwanda. And so then I became very interested in, well, let's try to figure out more about how business works sort of organically or naturally. Um, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa in, in general. Uh, and so I ended up going to do my field work in Ghana, largely because of a pre-existing partnership between IV as well as a university in Ghana, All Nations University in Kofuritua. Um Because basically I would go there and I would teach them how to use, teach some of the faculty how to use cases and then they would host me. Uh, and, and they gave me some research assistance, but that didn't work out well because they were undergrads who had zero desire to actually help me. Uh, so I eventually ended up uh, finding, he was actually the, the first person I ever interviewed, his name was Aminu, um, and he eventually became my research assistant. Uh, Aminu was awesome. Uh, if anybody ever wants to buy jewelry, uh, let me know because I have so much jewelry from Aminu. It's actually like, it's kind of ridiculous. Like, I will buy some. Okay, I've got, a, really? Yeah, we'll that, that plug usually doesn't work. Cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you an email. We have a, an extensive jewelry okay. collection. Like, there was one time I came home with 46 pounds of jewelry. <laughs> like, there's a lot of jewelry. I own more jewelry than some jewelry stores. Um, and I just transferred them like $900 to bring me more. Uh, okay, cool. We'll, we'll, we'll not, talk. Not $900. <laughs> yeah. Um, I sell it on Etsy for them now. Uh, anyways, we're getting a little off track, but uh, I mean, in terms of you know good memories, these are some of them. Because uh, I'm sure as we'll get into, things can often be uh, uh, um, a little difficult while doing field work in uh, in in Ghana. And <laughs> having these funny stories and having a meaner to speak to is certainly helpful. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there, and then I, my work kind of progressed. I, I think I've been back to Ghana eight times and have, that's progressed into projects in a number of other places, so. Ah, this is a very interesting story. Um, we'll, we'll talk more. I, I remember one of the memorable moments that Sarah shared with me one time when I was talking about my project, and she was in somewhere in Syria alone when the Ebola outbreak broke out. And I think she was like, she had some stories like, oh, there's Ebola in the next village. And she called Canada and they said, pack your things. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> the very next day, <laughs> she was. <laughs> so, so I was in Ghana during the Ebola outbreak in, uh, in Sierra Leone. And I came back and I was teaching in January. And like three of my students went to the program office to be like, we're concerned about being taught by him. <laughs> And I was like, what? <laughs> There's nothing in Ghana. That just, speaking of misconceptions, that story had to be shared. It's part, of, yeah, it's part of the myth making of, of Africa as this, you know, disease ridden yeah. one country without borders, yeah. kind of. Uh, Madagascar has always been having a, a plague problem, <laughs> so. Uh, one of the few countries in the world that still has plague and has like pretty wide outbreak basically every year. Um, but then, yeah, like you would see the numbers coming from the news every day. Like I have a Google alert on the news from Madagascar, and then when it's plague season, then it's every day the top news is how many people are, are you know are having plague. But then, yeah, but you stay safe. How did that affect your opinion of? like deciding to go to this place like how did these these myths of course there are, are cases but how did the sort of 
overreaction and exaggeration of worry uh, make you feel, or yeah. how did you manage that? It's a lot of over exaggeration, I would say, because mm -hmm. because uh, Madagascar is a giant island, and the, the cases are mainly on the central highlands where there uh, there is a big population of black rats, right? Mm -hmm. And then. Um, but like the place on the coast, especially where Andrew and I work, uh, it's not. There, there was no case last year. Like last year was the most serious outbreak in history, but then there was no case in the, on the coast. So, yeah, and with Ebola, it was you know I was there, and no one around me had known what it was, and when I'd mention it, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, there's. We, we've seen this before, we know how to deal with it. And the Canadian government is like, I'm pulling you out, you've got a flight tomorrow. <laughs> um, you know, at the and they wanted to pull me out because they didn't want me to like have to go through any travel restrictions or yeah. be in any court. Like they had no idea what was going to happen. Um, and I think because I was close to the Liberian border, uh, outside of free, like way outside of Freetown, it was a worry as well. You know, because my thesis is going to actually focus on Ebola, so I, I've read a lot, and um, yeah. Ebola was a different ball. It, it right. was the last experience was, it was, I mean, the world wasn't ready for that kind of event, and when eventually it happened, it, it because they were not ready, they were not prepared. It, it you know, it was very devastating, and um, it will be interesting to see, for me, it will be interesting to see how decision making actually happens around that kind of time. So that at least you could prepare decision makers for such events. Because in an event like that, decision making is the most important thing. It has to be fast, responsive, and on point. OK, I will go. Now let's talk about these countries, Ghana and Madagascar, from your own <coughs> view, from your own viewpoint, your own perspective. Can you tell us what, what, what is interesting? Tell us about the country. What what's special about the country? Um, usually, when you go to a country and going for twenty five years, you somehow get attached. Oh yeah. You get really attached to the country, the people. You know, so many things. There are so many things that just make you get attached. So maybe you can just share your experience. Well, in the, in the, for the sake of uh, keeping time, I won't. Uh, <laughs> I won't say everything. <laughs> but I could say. I mean, something uh, as. Um, as a, an, an anthropologist and someone interested in, in, in s some of the issues that, that you were talking about, about how you know the contemporary world is shaped by history. And Madagascar is interesting in part because of its very distinctive um, history. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very large island. It's much, if you look at a map, you see how big it is. It's got a very, a much larger population than most people know. So it's coming up on, I think it's around 30 million. Um, uh, it's 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 geographically incredibly diverse, um, and yet you've still got a single language um, spoken in very different ways in different parts of the island. Uh, so there's this interesting mix of diversity and and sort of singularity in this place. But as I said, one of the things that's most interesting about it is its very distinctive history and, and its place in the world. And the the, the research that I, I you, you mentioned there this stuff on mining and ecotourism. I, uh, something that, that you know, is interesting to think about there is, you know, Madagascar, many people who've seen the movie, the cartoon Madagascar, <laughs> students still sort of sometimes imagine this as this far off place that's completely disconnected uh, from the rest of the world. And yet it has been more connected to the rest of the world over the last 500 years than most other places in the world. And one of the reasons for that is where it sits in the Indian Ocean, like other Indian Ocean islands. It's, it's been a meeting place of, 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 of people from, uh, from the East and from, from Europe and uh, from Africa and really from all over. It was originally settled by Austronesian people and then had a lot of African um, influence. Um, and then, you know, through from the from the 16th century on, was an important source of various natural resources, and and, and a, a stopover on trade routes going from Europe to the to, to Asia, 
And so it's just this fascinating mix. And where we work, especially up in the north, because it's a coastal city, uh, it's a coastal region, and the city where this university where we work is based is right on one of the world's largest, most spectacular natural ports. It's just a real melting pot. So although Malagasy is still the predominant language, you get a sense of the, 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 this incredible history and diversity of cultural influences uh, that's really, really um, amazing. If you get the chance to visit, you, you really should. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a unique and terrific place. Yeah, I won't say too much about it, uh, but one thing I do want to emphasize is that um, the thing that Madagascar attracts me the most is not about the its unique, uh, you know, flora and fauna. Of course, it is something that attracts me. Like it's, of course, they have the most adorable lemurs in the world. <laughs> the only <laughs> lemurs in the world. <laughs> <laughs> then, um, um, the, the the chameleons and everything, but um, I think it's also it's mainly the people and how the way people are really deeply involved with each, with each other, and that uh, is is really different from. Uh, from where I'm from, the, the you know, from urban China, uh, where you know Chinese middle class are really just trying to pursue this materialistic wealth, and and also this Canadian environment that personal privacy and you know it's very much valued. Uh, but then once you go there, you realize that people are really deeply involved with each other, um, and this is a completely different experience. Um, and I remember that uh, I had a very good friend. Um, she is a, a doctor from a doctor student, like study medicine from Germany, and she spent nine months in Madagascar. And before she left, she said, "Okay, big man, I'm going to go back to you know running water, stable electric, uh, stable electricity, Wi-Fi, 24/7, and unhappy, unhappy people." Unhappy people. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So, yeah. So that was something that really um, that drives me that want me to go back all the time, makes me want to go back all the time. Did you want to say? I mean, feel free, or I can go. I go. Okay. Um, so Ghana, uh, what do I say about Ghana? Um, I feel like I should not be explaining Ghana. I can more so explain my take on, uh, on Ghana. Um, and I must start off with the thing that most immediately hit me, both literally and figuratively, when I landed, and that is that it is very warm and humid, and I'm way too Polish for that heat, so that can pose a bit of a challenge. But uh, um, as you were saying, I, I think a lot of what also struck me is is just the, the closeness of social networks and, and, and how important that relational aspect is to getting anything done that's actually... Um, found its way into pretty much all of my research and, and if we look at how business works it, it's because of that and so uh, it makes it an interesting place to work um, it's certainly a bit of an adjustment from coming from Canada where we're used to you know having our personal space and our personal bubbles to uh, uh, it's hard to go for a jog without being like having little children chasing you around, um, which is kind of adorable, but kind of like, I don't want to be responsible for you. Don't trip uh, at the same time. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what, what else I can really say about, uh, about Ghana other than it's, it's a great place. And I've, I've unfortunately been uh, unable to do a lot of traveling throughout Ghana, but in the few places I've visited, it's uh, it's awesome. Um, there's these waterfalls in Wili. Did you ever go to Wili? I did. Wili's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, I had so Wili. There's these waterfalls. You get to climb up to them, and uh, uh, so I had like hiking boots on, and the guy who was my guide had pink flip flops on. Uh, he was a champ. Like he was he was fast. Um, so that was that was good. that was a good memory, which just brings me back to a sort of a point that I, I had written in my notes that I wanted to make is like, you know, when you're spending three months or a month or two months in a place, uh, that can get really tiring after a while if you're doing work day after day after day. And I've always found it's been really helpful to spend take a couple of days at the end and go do something that's nice and relaxing because then it sort of leaves you with some good memories. Um, Let's you digest everything that's happened, but also leaves you with like a yeah, that was pretty awesome, and let's 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 leave with a focus on uh, focus on that rather than you know some of the hardships of uh, trying to get your interviews done and, and running into some challenges. So, mm -hmm. I guess just to add to the to echo what what you said and what you guys said about you know the social networks, it's, 
perhaps this is a theme running both in Madagascar and Ghana, but people are, are very, de very dependent on uh, social relations. And for, for me anyway, that's, that's the way I want to live. That's the way I want to do my work. Those are the kinds of environments that I want to be in. Um, and I actually sort of worry that as uh, countries move from you know, becoming more capitalistic or entering into globalizing economies that some of these social relations and these networks uh, sort of fade away. And so one, one way I like to describe this to people is like, yes, I'd love Ghana to have a really great, strong, functioning healthcare system, right? Of course. Uh, but I would also love people to continue to take care of each other when uh, people are sick, as opposed to here where, you know, I could you, I could be in my apartment, <laughs> very sick, and no one would know that I'm sick for like a week. S whereas in Ghana, that's inconceivable. You've uh, got the proper drugs, but nobody cares. But nobody cares, right? So uh, that's something that makes work uh, in Ghana, some or doing research in Ghana, uh, in my opinion, or at least the research I do, easier because people want to talk and they're curious about you as much as you're curious about them. Uh, and I guess to add to the Ghana specifics, it's quite diverse as well. So there's, I think, over 60 or more languages spoken in the country. So if you wanted to uh, do any research, you really have to learn a local language. English is the national language, but it's very much like a secondary uh, language spoken at home um, and among friends. So that makes research challenging, uh, of course, but more interesting, obviously. And um, you have to be part of those networks to do any research and uh, yeah, get into, and I was obviously in the north, so it was hot, but it wasn't humid, it was dry, uh, which so could nice. make it nicer, but also, you know, much hotter as well. Uh, I really like that weather, so if you can't do well in heat, maybe, it makes it, you know, 42 degrees is unbearable for anyone, but <laughs> yeah, it's hot and, dr and dry where I was, so, yeah, that's gone. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Patrick said something that was really interesting. I mean, trying to go out after, you know, your work, if you have a two-month project or something, spend like five days and go somewhere different, mm -hmm. go somewhere that makes you see another part of that country. Because sometimes, you know, when you go to work each day and back, that, that routine, that movement becomes routine, you, you, you know, there's nothing new about going to the office and coming back, but, you know, some, some outing could actually help. I, I remember one time I, I went to Switzerland and I, I went to this city where there was like the, the chocolate factory. I think you've seen Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So there was actually yeah. a chocolate factory in that city. Nice. And, um, you didn't fall in the river. I, I didn't even go. And so, <laughs> so one advice, and then there was the Swiss Alps. So yeah. the train goes from there to the top of the mountains. And my advice, before you go to any country, check on the internet about the country. <laughs> check, where, check where all the nice spots yeah. are so that you can plan for it. Yeah. Because if not, you probably just go and come back without yeah, memories. It's true. So it's learn from my experience. I, I didn't go to any of them. And the day after, the day before we were supposed to come back, someone said, oh, we're just coming from the Alps. The Alps are in the city. I didn't even know. <laughs> and I didn't know. <laughs> so but, very good advice. But it's, it's true. Like even in Ghana, you know, if you were to go to Accra, go from the airport to the tourist area to the university, let's say, you would have a very different idea of what Ghana is compared to where I was in Ghana, where it was a rural area, you know, you know, there weren't any fancy global restaurants and supermarket chains. And so it's important to look at things from multiple perspectives if you have the opportunity or to be humble about what you know about a country because it is so <laughs> diverse, right? So. And I think it's helpful also because it gives us different perspectives of life. Mm -hmm. If if I'm used to a particular place and I'm, I don't know what others are going through in another part of the world, I never would appreciate what I have. And so those those experiences are actually very humbling mm -hmm. and um, very, very nice. I just want to add one thing and it's like, so I've always felt this tension of like, so I, I'm supposed to be traveling to Ghana to do a certain amount of research. And I've always felt this tension between like, now I shouldn't go spend three days going on a bit of vacation somewhere because I feel like then I'm not doing the work I'm supposed to. 
Um, and I, I, I found though personally for me, it, it's so quite often I'll just keep working the whole time and I come back and I'm super tired and I haven't processed everything yet. But like, I've kind of started trying to force myself to do that because it's, it's really helpful for just processing again everything you've that's take that you've taken in that trip versus like if you try to do that when you're back from a research standpoint, you come back and there's a whole bunch of stuff you got to do that you haven't been doing because you've been away. So it's I, I guess both from a mental health standpoint of uh, uh, um, of just digesting everything um, and uh, an overall efficacy standpoint, I, I think it does help. Um, but it just makes it easier for me. I mean, other people, other people who are might have an easier time, but that's been helpful for me. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I would, um, because of time, I would rush. I'll put some together so that um, some of the points that I wanted to find out, so that um, we could also give room for some questions and answers. And so, what type of research did you do in in Africa? You know. Tell us about qualitative methods, quantitative, just something unique about your project that you think will be interesting that others might want to hear about. Um, we could also look at how do you want to give back to the, to the country that you've worked in. So just tell us about your research and then how you think you can give back um, you know, your findings in such a way that it will benefit those while you're also um, putting what you've done into uh, you know, a database where others can read about it and learn from it. So we could just merge those two and then we'll take the last one before we have questions and answers. Well, I can, I, I can start with a, with a story that kind of connects those two because um, the, uh, as, uh, doing the kind of research I did as a doctoral student, I was focusing on very kind of traditional anthropological topics about ritual and history and local conceptions of history. Um, and one of the questions that was always in my mind is, well, of what use is this <laughs> to the people I'm working with? Because you know I'm clearly learning things and benefiting from it. And not the people I was living with were very happy to talk to me about this stuff and actually very encouraging. And, and we did produce some things like local um, you know, we, we the, the stories that I would write were transcribed, uh, that I would record were transcribed and then written out and then became things that people could pass around and things like this and this was valuable. But uh, it, it, from the start it was a concern of mine and what I, I very nearly, I think I told you this, very nearly stopped, just said I can't do this, I don't know what this is doing. Because, and not to say that I saw that people and in, in the, the people I, I had come to know were um, somehow expecting me to be doing more for them. In fact, they weren't. But my sense that, well, there are really pressing, important questions to be addressed in Madagascar, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, where um, uh, you know, um, life expectancy is probably about 70% of what it is in Canada, where infant mortality rates are high. There are, there are important, big issues facing people in Madagascar. And, what am I doing? Um, as time went on though, and I kept going back, I ended up focusing a little more carefully on, on issues that were of clear concern to people. So one of them were, were, were so some of them were related specifically to conservation, environmental conservation, but also artisanal mining, which was, has become a huge industry in Madagascar. Uh, once again though, the things, the kinds of things I was doing research on, and what we tend to do in anthropology is take simple stories about, say, how conservation is good and artisanal mining is bad and make them complicated, which again does what anthropology wants us to do, but of what use is it to people. Um, but I still believe in the value of, of the, this kind of approach that I've been taking in research. So when I came here to Western and I had a secure job, that golden thing, I uh, had a secure job, um, I, I, I started working on what has become now, uh, it's now been almost 12 years, this collaborative project with a university uh, in, in, in Madagascar, which has involved over the years bringing students from here to Madagascar, bringing students from Madagascar here, 
um, working on a variety of different collaborative research projects. The one that we're working on now, which is probably sort of somewhat related to, to, to issues of broader concern, is focusing specifically, as, as you mentioned, on these very small-scale um, transnational projects. And you've all seen examples of these if you've traveled in Africa, I'm sure, or even if you've traveled around on your Facebook page or on GoFundMe page or something like that. These are, you know, micro NGOs. Sometimes they're not even NGOs. They're tiny little projects of people who decide, I want to build a school in this community and I just need $10,000 to do it. Or I want to um, start an orphanage or I want to... Um, protect this little bit of forest and all I need is five thousand dollars. This is these are foreigners. In Madagascar over the last twenty years this has been a really significant development and I think it's a really interesting one, very telling of our of our times and of how aid and humanitarianism works in the world today. And so with these with this this collaboration we had students from Western and students from the University of Ansarana in Madagascar working together within projects like these, doing research on them. That was at once of use to them. They were doing things that those organizations wanted them to do, but also thinking about what are these projects all about, how do they work, when they don't work, why don't they work, things like that. So this is the most sort of applied kind of project I've done over the year, but I think the most significant contribution to get to the giving back part of it has been realizing, well, what is it that I do and can do well, and I think part of what I do and can do is find funding for projects in which I can involve Malagasy students and help to train them in social research methods and various other skills that they can then take into other work that they that they do. And it's you know one of the nice things about doing this now over the long term is seeing those students who have come out of that then go on to other opportunities and do other things and you know building on the experiences they've had in these projects. It's been really that's been very satisfying, I guess. So that's my story. Okay. Um, so for me, um, yeah, there is only so much you can do as an individual researcher when you go there. Um, and like recently, the area that we work in in, North Mad in northern Madagascar, there is a uh, flooding going on and the road is broken. Everybody has been complaining, the government and everything. But then <coughs> you just feel what really you can do for um, to change the situation of poverty and you know people's suffering. Um, but I mean, from at this moment, what I feel is that a, to, to, as a researcher, to represent the situation, the real situation, as, as, as most accurate as you can, is the best you can do. Um, for example, I know like how, how for example, development A's go, uh, going on in Madagascar is still operating under this neoliberal capitalism idea logic. So uh, yeah, the money comes from World Bank or it comes from other international agency and it goes into Madagascar. But then how it works there is like still the contractors are probably making up profits. And then the, the, the bureaucracy of all kinds of levels will probably cut corners of this money. And then like how it actually a development aid works out on the local uh, level, it's, it's really hard to say. And, and it's still under Freely, for for me, I think it's still really operating under a neoliberal uh, capitalism economy. Um, but on the personal level, I think just really the whatever you can do to to help people. Um, for example, when I worked there, I was um, volunteer teaching at a local university, uh, teaching them English, um, because the American Peace Corps volunteers are not sending teachers to the university anymore. Um, and also, when you work there, you you. you you are, you're collaborating with your um, interpreter or uh, research assistant and that actually just on a personal level actually help this person a lot because they might be struggling finding a job I mean they have the language skills but then they couldn't find a job so um, that is something that satisfies me most and you know that you know you actually helped this this specific person um, to kind of improve their life even if it's temporarily but then you know you've got this connection with them and then even when they're in trouble they can come back to to get help or they have a way to channel their voice out uh, and that was really valuable I think for people there. 
It, yeah, it's a, it's a hard question. Uh, how is your research going to be useful uh, to people? <coughs> Well, so I did both qualitative and quantitative research, uh, and I would say in, I can use both of that research in different ways for different purposes. So the qualitative research allowed me to develop uh, close enough relations in communities uh, to get at uh, what people's root cause of their problems are, uh, and also because I was working sort of through the Ministry of Food and Agriculture and coming from a place of development work, uh, these communities didn't often ask me, you know, what are you going to do for us now because I had already been there doing things. So I was working on uh, training programs, business training programs, uh, agriculture extension work, uh, and then in a lot of cases actually worked on people's farms. Uh, and that's what drew me to doing a PH, PhD research because I, I understood that actually all this work I was doing wasn't actually doing what we thought it would. And so part of the issue is okay, we need, you know, being an unbiased, you know, not working for USAID or for uh, the other projects, uh, you know, whatever projects are going on there, I can take an impartial look and then advise the Canadian government, which has $25 million in the main Ministry of Agriculture's campaign. So my research has developed sort of a case study that I hope I can pass on to Canadian government, to the ministry there, and their policy and their aid strategy from the farmer perspective, which is often lost uh, when you know the policies get made at the top. And then even at the district level, this, the staff there don't necessarily work with all the different kinds of farmers and community members and their needs. So my research focuses heavily with women because women are often excluded from a lot of uh, policies and programs and their voices are not heard. So part of it is to include them better. Um, and then I specifically chose communities that were involved in a USAID project. So I have these sort of detailed cases of how this project is impacting or not impacting people's lives, how it's working or not working. Uh, so I hope in the end of my PhD, and I don't think it's going to be translated in my thesis, so I don't think you'll you'll get the detail that a USAID, you know, program manager or a, you know, DFAD-D, whatever the Canadian, Global Affairs Canada. <laughs> it's been um, like three during Right, three. exactly. So I don't think they're going to read my thesis and be satisfied with it. And so I hope as soon as I get a draft of my thesis done, I can then develop those reports that can uh, even if, you know, talking, you know, the Canadian government now has a new feminist aid strategy, so I can start to contribute to what that actually looks like for people's lives. So that's the hope. And then what was really great about the quantitative research is that um, I can actually provide summary reports of demographic data that isn't included in communities, libraries, and ministries, libraries. So I actually have a lot more data than the local ministry offices and the local uh, chiefs and elders even know about their communities. So I hope, I actually intend to, you know, develop short summary reports and I, and I sort of made an informal promise in part of my, you know, data collection agreement to be able to be in those communities to give at least that back. And in my postdoc, so I'm going to be starting a short postdoc in September at Waterloo is hoping to continue my postdoc research so I can go back there and do presentations and do community meetings. So that's the goal. But at the end of the day, it's really hard because, you know, IDRC doesn't give you funding to do this. Shirk pays you a salary. Um, you can barely get money to go to conferences, let alone to, to send reports uh, and to, do, to go to do these meetings and then having the network, like if I wasn't working in development, I don't even know who to talk to in Global Affairs Canada or whomever. It's all through my personal network to figure out how this is going to benefit people. So, and then obviously there's the community side of it, right? So, you know, I, I was a manager of a football, a boys football club, and I've paid so many school fees, and I've got, you know, godchildren and those things, so you can try your best at the personal level, because at the day, you know, they're your, they're your PhD, like they're the people who gave you that, that 
your your whole your whole thing is because of them. So you do anything that you can, um, and that's that's part of the process, I suppose. But there's not really a clear clear answer to how the research will have impact. Yeah, I mean, I I, I echo that. I'll just speak briefly, um, and then come back to that point briefly, though. Again, I know time wise. Um, <laughs> So briefly, I mean, uh, most of my research is looking at entrepreneurship in, in, in Ghana, uh, at least my dissertation stuff was, and trying to understand just the nature of well, how does business work sort of organically, because I see a lot of development organizations do a lot of really stupid things and like really stupid things. Um, like, hey, let's train an entrepreneur the same way we train them in London, Ontario, because that's going to work great, because, yeah, that was sarcasm. It, it, would w it will work terribly. Um, <laughs> And like I've seen this repeatedly across countries, and so I mean, to me, the way that my research ends up giving back is like by trying to make those programs more effective. Because you know, there is a discourse on on whether or not there should be aid of any type. I tend to come down on the side of uh, I think that if done properly and if done actually respecting where people are at, there can be a net benefit. Um, of course, that a lot of that depends on things being done properly, and that's a bigger conversation. Um, and what I find more difficult is sort of to echo what Sierra was saying is, is like, well, I don't know who best. Like, if somebody comes and starts talking about this, I can talk your ear off about like all the stupid things I've seen done and what should be done differently. But it's a matter of how do you actually go out and get that involved in in, pol in the policy side, and that's difficult to do. Um, and then there's the more micro part. It's like, you know, I owe an awful lot to the, you know, especially the core 31 people who I interviewed like dozens of times or each of them like at, I think on average like eight times each and spent a lot of time just hanging around their businesses and I owe a lot to them and that's really the reason I was able to get my PhD done. But like, how do I give something back to them? Because it, it, it doesn't naturally come back to them. Um, and that's tough. I mean, that's part of the reason I sell jewelry for a couple of the jewelers, but that only does so much. Um, and it's it's tough because it does feel kind of one-sided. And I, I, yeah, I, I, I still haven't come around to how you deal with that. And I, I mean, part of the way it kind of gets squared in my mind is I stay in touch with uh, as many of the people as I can, and and. I sort of feel as though they, they genuinely just like talking to me about things, about like, you know, I've described what snow is to so many people, and they're just genuinely interested in that. Uh, but I, I don't know, I mean, there's still this notion of I feel like that's a hollow answer and I should do more, I just don't know what that is. So, I mean, I can keep talking about that, that all, a whole bunch. Um, but I'll, I'll, I know you were going to open up for questions and like if you're interested in things not to do and like you want to hear all the stupid things I've done, I can, I can tell you a lot. There's been a lot of stupid things I've done. Okay. One last question. Um, and so can you narrate some challenges that they encountered, you know, for our learning? I mean, you know, going to a country that is different from what you're used to. Every encounter you have is, is an experience. It's something to learn about. It's, um, some of them will be pleasant. Some of them will not be pleasant. Um, so, you know, and sometimes it's because you are naive about the way things are done that you fall prey to the unpleasant things. So it would be nice to actually hear about those things you've had, you know, you've experienced, like finances, uh, public transportation, logistics, visa challenges, etc., medical and healthcare, culture shock, food, dressing. You know, there was one time I remember I traveled to Ethiopia and I, you know, I, I said, okay, I, I have to be smart. I don't know how the people are here in, in the hotel where we stayed. So I took some money and kept it in different places. And I forgot where I kept it. <laughs> I've done that too. <laughs> I've done that too. <laughs> and I searched. Classic. And searched. Classic. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I know I hid it somewhere where I know that no one will find it, <laughs> including me. And so I know that <laughs> this is. So, It'll show up one day. Yeah. 
I found so it eventually, but yeah, sure. you know when you when you, after spending unnecessary hours looking for something that you cost yourself, you know, <laughs> that's a big lesson. So that is a tough one. You know, <laughs> you know. So maybe you can share some of the experiences you've had, and uh, it will help. Oh, everything's always gone perfectly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, there's so many, so many. Um, Challenges, I guess. Uh, I mean, a, bi a big one. A big, it, well, the, the, so f yeah, for sure. Of course, the food was difficult. Where, 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 I was living when I when I first went. It's the the, the staple of the Malagasy diet is rice, and it's wow. rice and not much else. Um, three meals a day. Where I was living, I was living with a in a village with a family, and and. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I, that was that was definitely a challenge. I remember fantasizing about pizza <laughs> as, a, as a, when I first went. But that goes away pretty quickly. And then actually, what happens is when you came come home, if you found this, you come home and you realize, oh, God, I need a giant bowl of rice. I can't. <laughs> so I remember going to a Chinese restaurant in Toronto when I got back and realized, oh my God, they give you so much stuff and so little rice, like so much <laughs> sauce. So, you know, Chicken and there's so little rice. I just eat it. <laughs> uh, but um, a, a big one, a big one for for me was language. So I spoke French when I went, but the community I was living with, there was one man who spoke French, um, but everyone else just spoke Malagasy, and I had no training in Malagasy, and so it was a it was a very slow process learning to speak the that the local dialect of Malagasy, uh, and. Uh, but that ended up being so important to 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 to, to what I ended up doing, and it's something I'm still able to call on, even though I'm not as proficient as I used to be. But uh, it's that that's a, that's a that's a big chance for, for 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 me. Nice. Okay. Um. So I'm just gonna quickly say two things, <laughs> two challenges. Um, so as Wuxie has introduced, like my research is about the, the meaning of being Chinese in Madagascar. So it's not just like uh, meaning how, what, what a Chinese person uh, is like, or it's also about what Chinese commodities are meant to, to local people and what Chinese cultures are represented and language are taught. So that means that I have to hang out with both Chinese uh, workers in Madagascar and the Malagasy. Um, and one of the biggest challenge uh, and that was a lot of discouragement came from that was gaining access to, uh, to the you know to the community to, to both community. I mean the Malagasy people are in general pretty um, welcoming um, unless you don't talk about poli <laughs> politics <laughs> and then they get suspicious because oh you're a Chinese are you working for a Chinese company <laughs> and then when I go to the talk with the Chinese and they are they are they're, they're showing more suspicions, <laughs> the suspicion than the Malagasy because uh, they don't like me nosing around things. You know, um, I remembered um, I wor when I worked at a sugar plantation, uh, there was this. It took me a long time to actually gain the trust, um, and then when I traveled with the Malagasy businessman to Guangzhou to do his business, and the moment we stepped, I stepped in into this uh, local um, pretty. A, a hotel which is in bad condition. And the moment I stepped in with a group of Malagasy businessmen and the Chinese um, working there were looking at me like, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, and then, uh, and of, of course, the people at the Confucius Institute also, I, I'm sure they wouldn't want me to know certain things. Uh, and that was my biggest challenge, like in terms of uh, gaining access because the, the Chinese people would joke about me like are you Malagasy or Chinese why are you keeping saying in favor of the Malagasy and um, yeah and then the Malagasy would would say that oh you're the most the Malagasy Chinese that I ever met <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the other biggest ch the other challenge that I had was really I had difficulty getting long-term visa mm -hmm. we talked about it Patrick the you other did. day because um, the second trip I made was uh, meant to be a year, um, but then uh, how the visa works in Madagascar is you, if you get, go with a tourism visa, you can get one month to three months, no problem, it's very easy, you get it at the airport, um, but then if you want to stay 
long time, longer than three months, it's a lot of, um, it just you don't know which government agency even to go to. Um, <laughs> Uh, I had I had a Malagasy friend uh, helping me, and we we went to so many government agencies, like including the Ministry of Higher Education, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Ministry of Interior Affairs, and the Mayor's Office. And we get tons of documents done, and still we get picked, being picked at. And this is wrong. This is not right. So it took me a long time to finally get the visa, and even to just find out where to get where to get it done. So. That is something, and nobody had any uh, concrete experiences about it. Like, this is your step-by-step -step <laughs> procedure to get a long-term Malagasy visa. Um, so that was that gave me a lot of stress in the beginning because then, you, if you don't get a visa, then there's no other way. You have to go and come back and go come back again. That was too much traveling. Interesting. It's always interesting to hear about other people's challenges, as you know, I can relate to some, and then others I realize, wow, I had an easy time. <laughs> um, well, because I, I was able to get a visa quite easily. Um, that's maybe the difference between a place like Ghana and Madagascar. Um, but equally so, I, I think I wrote down here, uh, thinking about my greatest challenge was translation, uh, without a doubt. I struggled to find a good translator, and I think if I tried to spend five years there learning Dagbani, which was the local language, I there's no way. I mean, to t talk about some of the complex ideas, it, I, I still would have wanted to rely on someone who knows the language much better than I could. Uh, so that was a challenge to both train and find a, the, a right translator on the language, but then also uh, to find and train someone to ask the kinds of questions that you want to ask. So my research was a lot about uh, gender issues, and like all of us, we have gender biases um, about, about the world and gender norms, and if you haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it, then you just kind of move around in the world with these biases, and so it's very hard to then try and think through what they are and ask questions about them. And so my challenge was trying to find the right person um, to, to, to train them and, and get through that. So I struggled a lot uh, with that. And it's, it's harder, it's easier with quantitative research because you have standard questions. Qualitative research is uh, very, very critical to have good translators. Um, and so my recommendation would be to spend time investing in, in translators, uh, both on your research topic and what you're trying to accomplish. And sometimes that requires like trial and error and testing it and then doing more training. So in Ghana, this really mattered particularly around develop the development talk. So farmers really knew what you wanted to hear, what they <laughs> think you wanted to know. So just a small example is I would come there and if I were to ask, okay, what do you want to improve your farming? They would say fertilizer. And they would say fer like chemical fertilizer, MPK, because that's what the government is providing and subsidizing and all the NGOs are doing and um, even the farmer unions are advocating for it. And to be fair, their soils are dead. They need something to improve their soil fertility. But when you actually talk to them further, you realize they're like, actually fertilizer is killing our soil. And so you kind of need to, to talk around the issue <coughs> And, and follow up with, okay, so why do you need the fertilizer? Why is your soil dead? What, what's the consequence of fertilizer? And go back and forth and, and ask it in so many different ways to really understand it's not fertilizer they want. They want to improve the fertility of their soil. And actually they think the fertilizer being provided by the government and NGOs is doing more harm than good. And they actually explained it to me like, listen, I'm, we're addicted to it. It's, a, it's like a drug addiction. It's like, okay, this is going in my thesis, <laughs> you know? So something, something like that, and it's the same, and then, you know, taboos, things you're not supposed to talk people, I'm talking about food insecurity. A lot of people didn't want to admit that, they're, that they are struggling with feeding their families, and so they'll talk about around the issue, they'll say, you know, that, yeah, there's hungry people in my community, but really they're talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. So 
And then, you know, you have to ask so many different people in so many different ways. And so even interpreting my results is a challenge. Uh, so that, that's one challenge. And then just two other challenges that I would say something related to what we've been talking about, and, it, and that is taking care of yourself as a researcher is a really big challenge because if you don't feel well physically and emotionally, then you're, it'll come out in the kinds of questions that you ask and in the research. So doing things like eating good food and exercising and we, we had a, yeah, getting enough sleep is a big, and these are really simple things, but they get totally lost when you start to get out into the field and you have really long days and you have the really hot days and you're eating rice every single day or something. <laughs> Uh, and it's dry and you're exhausted. So I had a couple of rules that were hard and fast and they were never broken. And because of that, I think I managed to keep myself fairly reasonably healthy. So one of the rules was never get on the back of a motorcycle without a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a constant point of contention uh, because people would make fun of me because I would be going from here to here and need to carry my helmet. This is ridiculous. <laughs> but I, you know, I would explain to them, are you going to call my mother when we get in an accident and say your daughter, and they're, so they understood Sierra needs a helmet. Uh, another rule was I never travel at night. So yeah, this goes back definitely. to public transit is by far the most risky risky thing when you're traveling in any any country, particularly in, a, in the global south where maybe infrastructure isn't, regulations aren't very high. So that's very important. And the third, what was the third rule that I had? Uh, those were the two main ones, but, and, and food obviously, uh, for me I'm a vegetarian, makes it challenging because uh, waterborne diseases and uh, poorly regulated farming, I actually could see the, the contamination of farms, uh, and so I can see the contamination of vegetables and things, and so I actually made a point at one point in time not to eat any vegetables that were, that were fresh, unless I was like scrubbing them with soap or bleaching them, because typhoid is real and it sucks, let me tell you. So I had, I, at some point in time, I, you know, my, the doctor was like, stop, stop. And same with bottled water, or I filtered my own water. And I didn't drink any pure water sachets. I had to stop because typhoid is real, you know. So I, I was, and I, I went to bed at eight o'clock every day or nine o'clock mm -hmm. every day. So I didn't go. I had to stop hanging out with friends late at night. Stop hanging out with the expats, drinking beer. That was my rule because that was the only thing I could do to keep myself healthy. So taking care of yourself is the biggest priority. Maybe that's taking vacations or going to bed early, or whatever it is you need to do. Um, and then the last thing was just about, uh, yeah, the knowledge translation piece, the giving back with your data is a big challenge that I am completely dissatisfied with, and I'm hoping I can find some opportunity to do something about. Yeah, <laughs> and just so for me briefly, uh, just I, I wanted to first touch on rules. So, uh, rule zero was always be prepared. Rule one was bring duct tape. Yes, um, duct tape yeah. so important. Yeah, so important. Yeah, one time I had to duct tape my shoe back together in the middle of a mountain. Um, that was fun, um, but I had to duct tape. And then, and then rule two was rule two was don't work on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, I feel you, like some of the struggles I had is, so I'm not the most sociable person at the best of times, e even in Canada, and so um, adjusting to being in a different place can be difficult for me. Um, I've gotten better at doing that. Uh, I also tend to really like to have my set routines, and that tends to go out the door when, when I'm doing research in another place, and especially when I have to travel like uh, all over the place, like one of my projects in Tanzania right now. Um, that becomes a challenge and, and you know I I think a big part of what's made that easier for me is is kind of changing my expectations of what I'm gonna get done in a day so instead of you know having I need to make sure I get all this stuff done before I go to bed it's like hey if it's not done by five or six then I'm just gonna forget about it and I'll, I'll come back to it so because it's like you you know not a sprint you're there for a while and the final thing that I, I personally did not do a good job of um, was learning local languages. I am not good with languages. Um, 
but I, I also feel that I should have put more effort into uh, at least learning some small talk because that I, I think there's a certain degree of respect for another's culture that's conveyed by at least being able to say uh, a few things, a few things beyond just hello and how are you. Um, so yeah. I, I think that this last point are very important, especially if you have plans to go to Africa yes. sometimes, because um, um, the change in, 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 in culture, your environment, mm -hmm. it sometimes could be a shock for you to leave Canada, for instance, go somewhere, and you have an expectations of how things should be done. Your, your mindset's already on the default with Canada, and so going somewhere else is like you know, changing the whole thing. I remember one time I went to Kenya, and um, Kenya drives on the right, and in Nigeria we drive on the left. I'm not sure again, left or right. <laughs> but I remember that I was about to cross the road one time, and I was looking, you know, they said, look, is it right first or left? Yeah, it depends on where you're going. <laughs> I was, <laughs> way. I was looking the wrong yeah. way, yeah. and at the yeah. point I was just about to step on the road, and one truck mm -hmm. was coming. I heard the horn like, "Does this guy want to commit suicide or what?" So that was a shock for me. I, I, I you know, that, that was my first experience in a country that drives on the right, and so it was total different shock for me. I was looking the wrong way, and the truck was coming on the other way. I was about to cross. So that in itself, those are the little experiences that you can make a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, I think one thing that can be very helpful is when you get there, always ask around, where are the places to go and the places not to go to? You need to know that, you need to know. And you know, a simple test is look at the expression on people's face. Yeah. <laughs> when you tell them, oh, I want to go to this place, just watch them. <laughs> You, you know, they can't hide it. <laughs> or, or when you're in that place and like nobody's smiling back at exactly, you. Exactly, and everyone is staring at you, then you know that you shouldn't be staying too long here. Yeah. You know, and um, just you know, back up and leave. those little tips can really make a lot of difference. Yeah. You know, there are some places that no matter how welcoming you are, even the people that live there will never go there. <laughs> you know, I, I was in South Africa one time and my friends took me out and I was like, there's a place there. So I said, if I walk, they said, you know, <laughs> you know, even South Africans will be very wary about going to that place. So those little tips makes a lot of difference. And so on that note, uh, I want to thank the speakers. I mean, they've been very wonderful. Uh, I'll just give like five minutes for questions. If you have any questions, you know. Sorry, I have to crack your exam. Yeah. It was amazing. I really appreciate all of your comments. I have some questions, but. Sierra works in my lab, so maybe I'll ask earlier. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'm sorry. It's yeah, okay. So if there are any Apparently. one or two questions or no pressure. Yeah. One or two things you want to add. Yeah. Um, so at what point did you be become comfortable with the uncomfortable? <laughs> That's a big they, they can, uh, six months. <laughs> <laughs> you mean just in general, like the discomfort of, of like of yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it took faster than you think. I think. I think it depends. I think it. How I. I have to say, uh, I. I. As much as it would. This is going to sound like I had it much harder, but I think it made it much easier. So when I first went, I was living in a small village in a tiny house. There wasn't much water. Again, the food was nothing. Like it was nothing uh, and then um, it involved I didn't have the sort of the language all these things to make it said this was also at a time now I'm really good at uh, 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 age uh, I'm, I'm really dating myself here there were no not only were there no cell phones there were no phones <laughs> like there was no way to communicate with home mm -hmm. when I take students now they are communicating with home all the time which in a way is great I think it's actually harder, though, <laughs> for them. You've said that to me. You made that comment to me once before. Yeah. That stuck with me because I, I like I've thought about that so many times and brought that point up with people. So yeah. like it's 
there's there's something there, and it, it makes me reflect on the way I deal with things. It's like maybe if I ignore Canada, then I integrate better at the beginning of a trip or something. Like there, there's something there. And the the, the other thing is like like and that that you know you mentioned sort of avoiding the expat. Now when I was there, there were many expats. There was certainly nothing in this community where I was living, <laughs> so you really had no choice. But this is my life, and actually once that sort of sunk in. You kind of sink into that. You go, hey, wait, wait, oh, that's great. That means I get to sleep for two hours after lunch and uh, go to bed early, which I loved. I loved going to bed at seven thirty and you know reading a bit and then waking up at five in the morning and like you get. It actually happened fairly quickly because of it. Because it wasn't. But that said, it also made the going back then um, kind of different. Difficult. I've always like found going back to be harder because it's like you get back home and people complain about stuff, and it's like, shut up. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> and also, the it's funny the things that you thought would drive you crazy after a while. I think you had this experience oh, yeah. too, like the fact that there's you're never alone, <laughs> which was difficult at first, but then you kind of get used to it, and then when you come home, and it's like, oh wait, I'm alone all the time now, and I can where I'm gonna add something. Yeah. So, you know, the, the thing that annoys me, annoys me the most was, you know, in Madagascar, you get on these uh, public transport, uh, ta like, they call it bush taxi. So basically it's like a minivan and then they put a lot more seats than it should take. Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot more people than, than <laughs> yeah. there are seats. Yeah. And then, so what's the most annoying thing is you can get on a minivan for like 36 hours continuously on a road trip and that there will be just this speaker right over your head <laughs> and then they'll be like continuously playing this traditional, like the most popular kind of song in Madagascar, but it's meant for dancing. It's meant for dancing. So it's like yeah. the beats and the rhythm. It's meant to keep the driver awake. <laughs> awake. <laughs> but it's right, you know. And I remember once I, I took this road trip, which was supposed to be 28 hours, but then it ended up 36 hours. And then. It doesn't matter at that length. Yeah. <laughs> it's, all it's, it's all bad. It's all bad. Every time. Bad. time <laughs> yeah. I told the driver, could you tune so it weird. off? <laughs> and he would, he would do it for two minutes, and then he would decide, okay, I'm too sleepy. I need to turn it <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. But when I come back, I started to drive my car. I, I made my, I burned myself a CD of Madagascar songs. Oh, nice. And then I put it in, and I was like, okay. If I don't put this music on, I don't feel like I'm even driving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 The the being un uncomfortable, being comfortable with the uncomfortable, um, it does happen. It it is easier than you expect, but you have to be in the right attitude for it. So I feel like my strategy was just trying to push myself to be very present in the moment. So it's like. I'm gonna get away from my computer. Like sometimes I'm so zoned into my computer or something. It's like, okay, look up, Sierra, look up, go outside. You've come all this way. Go outside. Get past that. It's like I'm gonna go to a bar and have a beer. So why with, with all these exes? Why am I here? Like this could be Canada. Let me go back out of this little bubble that is the expat community or like whatever. Just try and be very present, and then accept the fact that nothing goes according to plan, <laughs> nothing follows the schedule, and including transportation, but also meetings with people, be comfortable with the fact that you might not accomplish anything in that day, because that meeting might never take place. And then you've got to be comfortable with the fact that like, you could miss something, brilliant happening because everything just happens seemingly spontaneously and you can't you know you can't plan for it and so that actually told that experience totally changed my personality so here I still don't worry about time as you could probably tell by the way I talk you know I don't I, I don't stress about I don't rush anywhere much more relaxed things will get done eventually so it's actually changed my entire outlook on life and you can really see people stressing in Canada a lot. Of course things should move more efficiently in places. There should be you know, s some type of schedule. Things shouldn't just start four hours late. You know, It shouldn't take 36 hours to get somewhere where it should only take 10 or something. But like there is a pro to this sort of attitude that you can take on, I guess. That, yeah. <laughs> Your presentation, so your research is so, the studies are so interesting. 
Uh, last was the question to Mingyuan. Uh, I know your research kind of well. I thought that you had done that. It's the French which I go on to the church to degree. Um, so I know you you graduated from a top, top five Chinese university, and you are doing your PhD in Canada. So from some perspective, you are an elite, right? Yes, I'm privileged. Um, I and you, sure. grew up, you, you, you grew up in a middle or middle of a Chinese family in women in a big city, of course. You're, you're yes. They considered uh, an elite, right? So when you go, when you went to Madagascar, which is the developing country, um, has had your socioeconomic background and your educational attainment ever, uh, ever affected your research? I mean, uh, doing the communication between you and the Madagascar, uh, Madagascar people of Google and between you and those Chinese workers. Yes, because definitely. You have, you, like, all, all equal positions, right? Yes, I, first of all, I do not acknowledge like my privilege as the you know, only child generation uh, you know, from urban uh, Chinese uh, settings. Um, but yeah, it definitely affects. There is this always a power dynamic at play. Uh, with the Malagasy people, so obviously foreigners are rich, so uh, they would expect you to pay for things. And uh, you know, regardless, you are Chinese or you are you are Westerners, because if you can afford flying to Madagascar, then you are rich. Because a lot of people would never have the uh, it's it's never going to happen in their life. Um, and then about my positionalities regarding to the other Chinese people. Um, it is, it is wrong to assume that all Chinese are the same, from the same background when they're working in Madagascar, because a lot of them are from, um, like, a, you know, they used to work in factories, and they're not going through many years of school, and, you know, and, and compared to me, you know, I've done all my life with school, so, um, so it's definitely different. Um, and also the way they do things, because I would give them little lectures about what, why what you just said is a little bit racist, you know, and I would tell you why. <laughs> and then, How'd that go? That's a funny conversation. Um, that's why, uh, just that's why. You're racist. <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't really, uh, but in order to, but in the end, you know, you hang out with them and you do research with them. What they tell you is, is very interesting to know. And um, just have to, really blend in and don't be judgmental to anything and then you understand actually where they come from and why they stand at that point and that, that's really the only the only way to um, but definitely my I'm from a completely different background to a lot of the Chinese and Malagasy people that I've studied so thank you, thank you. Thanks for any more questions I've, I've really enjoyed um, the discussions. I think it was very thrilling. I think that um, we should have more of these mm -hmm. and then um, get more perspectives of different other different African countries. And um, one thing I know with African countries that eventually the, the thing you shouldn't do is don't go and stay for too long. In the sense that by the time you're staying too long, you become attached. You become so you feel like it's home already for you and so anytime you're leaving you feel sad you feel like why am i leaving and I, I think that's one experience that i've had even as an african going to other african countries and spending some time there i become become so attached to the place and i feel like if i have the opportunity of going back to work and you know i would, I would grab it and so that's one thing i would advise not to do even though it's advisable to do it. <laughs> I guess, I just before we end, I want to mention, so some of the alumni, the visiting students who are from Ghana, uh, who are back in Ghana now, I asked a few of them, or the association that they have, the group that they have, if they had any recommendations uh, for us as, as Canadians wanting or, or you know, international uh, to Ghana, foreign to Ghana, want to do research there. And they said a couple of things. One, they thought that the idea of going through a partner organization, so uh, they mentioned local universities, so getting in contact with faculty and students there uh, was really, really critical. And so to talk about that briefly, just 
to mention, like I made a point to meet with uh, faculty at both univer two different universities uh, in Ghana and try to also get advice from them about my findings and, and translation and these other issues I was having. So that's something they wanted to convey and they also mentioned ministries and other agencies to sort of work through because it's a way that you can get access to communities um, and get, get some basic knowledge, especially if you're going in without any. Uh, and then you can also give something back and build that connection. And then they wanted to reinstate, you know, reinforce the idea of connecting with them as alumni, as people who've been to Western, you can sort of know where you're coming from, speak your language, uh, and sort of ease you into that process so you're not alone. Or speak so they they sent me an email and I wanted to communicate <coughs> that as well. Yeah, it's, a, it's such a good a good point, and it's one of the things I've always stressed with the African Institute is that one of the things that this can do is bring together people who have these existing networks. So if you go if you look at this Facebook page that we've created for this project that we've been doing, we we just started in 2015 uh, the Facebook page, but. Uh, that what, what's happened over the past 10 years with all of these Malagasy students coming here and Canadian students going there is that we have this incredible network of people who all kind of know each other so now it's kind of nice whenever whenever I go back I know all of these people and they ask about and not just there in the at the university but also in the communities where we work and they do they all have to we've got we've got we've got at least one baby named after not not their baby, <laughs> but a baby named after uh, one of our students who was there, and they, who this baby was born when they were there, and some of the, that baby's growing up, and that that student is still That's in cool. touch. And this, you create these. I can't stress enough the. Um, I think one of the things that's become clear about this is that a lot of these projects that we get involved with, whether they succeed or they fail or whatever, we we really limit ourselves if we only measure success and failure based on whether we produce the result that we intended, the, the outcome, mm -hmm. to use the terms we use, and those those other things, those relationships, um, are often actually the things that our, our partners and our collaborators in Madagascar are far more interested in <laughs> than whatever that thing was that we were supposed to have produced. The, the fact that we have these relationships and that they keep kind of uh, um, going and that we acknowledge them and go back and all this stuff, that end has ended up being really, really um, important. And you know, one, one of the projects we've worked in, we worked with starting in 2008, it failed by 2011, <coughs> but then this last year it came back. And a lot of those same connections there were, and they were, and the reason it came back is because they got in touch with me on Facebook and said, "Hey, we're back. <laughs> Do you want to?" But it's because we had those ongoing connections that that was able to, we were able to reconnect with them, and now they're going great guns. That's great. Nice. Very nice. So once again, I want to thank everyone for coming.